First speaker, Dr. Thomas Crock, is really going to set the scene of, of what this is about. But um, the, the starting point is this National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, report on uh, radioactive sources and uh, potential alternative technologies. Uh, uh, and this sort of raises questions for the metrology community as to what uh, sources we actually need. Uh, we sort of get very attracted attached to our sources but I think in a uh, as we move forward we have to ask the question of how many of those do we really need to deliver our accurate metrology uh, for our various users um, so what we're going to do is have that presentation summary of the report from from Thomas uh, and then three uh, simple presentations from CCRI sections one two and three just setting the scene for uh, what sources are used, how they're used. Um, this is the start of a conversation within CCRI about the role of radioactive sources um, and the actions we might want to take to ensure that our metrology is unaffected or is improved uh, by looking at different technologies. This is not an answers seminar, this is perhaps more of a question seminar uh, in terms of st setting this issue. Um, and there is actually a task group within CCRI which will be looking at this in some more detail. And our plan is at perhaps the end of 2022, we will come back to you uh, with some more findings and some more recommendations for what the metrology community as a whole needs to be looking at um, uh, for radioactive sources. So without me talking any further, I'd love very pleased to introduce Dr. Thomas Crock from Fermilab. He was the chair of the NASEM committee that produced this excellent report. Uh, it is freely available um, and there's a huge amount of detail. They looked at a whole range of applications um, and looked at the various technologies there. So uh, he's gonna give a summary of that report uh, and then we're going to move on. Uh, what we'll try and do is we'll do all the questions at the end of all four speakers and at that point we'll also have a bit of a panel discussion which I'll start off uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll accept questions from the floor. So uh, Thomas, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you. I uh, really appreciate the invitation uh, to present our results here our findings. Uh, as Malcolm said, um, our study was on radioactive sources, applications, and alternative technologies. Um, this is, are the subject matter experts that were assembled uh, to produce this report. Um, here are the two uh, staff members of the National Academies that uh, assisted us. So in 2008, um, somebody else needs to mute, please. Um, in 2008, uh, the academies performed a study um, that was congressionally mandated and sponsored by the USNRC. Um, and an outgrowth of that study was the uh, effort currently underway to replace cesium chloride radioactive sources uh, throughout the US. Um, this study then um, was uh, initiated by the U.S. Nu National Nuclear Security Administration and was sponsored by Sandia National Laboratories, one of uh, the U.S.'s national laboratory system. Um, and in this, we reviewed uh, category one, two, and three sources. The previous study looked at only one and two. Um, we looked at domestic and international developments uh, with radioactive applications and, and alternative technologies. The uh, previous study only looked domestically. And then we assessed uh, the development of alternative technologies. Comparing the status of uh, the use of radioactive sources between the previous study and now, um, at that time, there were about 54,000 category one and two store sources um, that were being tracked in an interim database. Uh, now, um, there is a national source tracking system that identifies uh, over 80,000 category one and two sources. Um, 
Some additional regulations were implemented over that time. That was the addition of uh, 10 CFR Part 37. Um, we also we added the um, source collection and threat reduction program in addition to the offsite re source recovery program. Um, specific to cesium chloride irradiators, the cesium irradiator replacement project was implemented. Um, and in that time now, the National Nuclear Security Administration has been charged with promoting the use of alternative sources, alternative technologies. So we define, for in this report, we define uh, alternative technologies as something that can be used to replace uh, cesium chloride or cobalt-60 are the primary ones, but also uh, iridium, uh, selenium and that. Um, in this report, we do not, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little cross-tracked here. Um, so alternative technologies are those that do not use a radionuclide uh, as a source. Um, and the exception might be the use of a vitrified cesium-137 uh, as a possible alternative to cesium chloride. Um, the most advanced and commercially viable alternative technologies uh, are devices that use electricity to produce electron beams to either directly irradiate objects or indirectly produce x-rays with the collision of a metal target. Um, we looked at uh, three main categories, medical, industrial sterilization, and then other industrial uses. Uh, the medical includes blood, research, external beam radiotherapy, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, and high dose rate brachytherapy. For sterilization, we looked at medical device sterilization, food irradiation, and the sterile insect technique. Um, industrial included industrial radiography, industrial gauges, well logging, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, and pertinent to this group, calibration systems. Um, so in a broad overview, uh, this committee agreed with the 2008 Academy's report on the elimination of cesium-137 in the form of cesium chloride. Um, we do not attempt to prioritize any replacement strategies um, and we do not take the position that the possession of any category one to three radioactive sources, including cesium chloride, poses an unacceptable risk to society. Um, so, you know, I'll address this a little further when I get to our, our, uh, our last finding. Um, and we do not endorse any specific technologies or products that are discussed in the report. Uh, examples that we have in the report um, are ones that we were able to get uh, presentations on, um, but they don't uh, constitute any endorsement. Um, so this is kind of a, a uh, flow chart of some of the things that we, uh, some of the ideas and, and concepts in that that we use to identify or evaluate um, the safety and security risks of radioactive sources. Uh, things like activity, half-life, and dispersibility, um, whether or not the sources are prone to be able to be aggregated in bulk, um, their prevalence, their portability, their accessibility, um, and then security and, and, and response protocols. Um, just a few examples of uh, the risks, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, but um, they show the impact that even small amounts uh, can have when um, not used as, as, as intended. So um, the incident in, in Mayapuri, India, highlights the risk associated with the inappropriate disposal. Um, while the Fukushima incident was not a source uh, incident, but it demonstrated that uh, radiation can have a lo very large socioeconomic consequence, uh, even if it does not cause any immediate deaths uh, due to radiation. Um, 
the incident in, in Mexico highlights the risk associated with transportation. And then the University of Washington irradiator incident um, demonstrates that even a very small release of radioactivity can have a significant economic cost um, resulting from the disruption of normal operations of, of whatever facility may be involved. Um, this is data from an IAEA uh, database um, showing the, the number of incidents uh, that have been reported uh, over the years uh, involving radioactive sources. And you can see that over time, um, it appears to be growing or depending on um, how the reporting goes in that uh, is at least constant. Um, and showing some of the material types that have been involved in these incidents. And you can see that one of the, the major ones is, is cesium. Um, 37 since 2018 and previous to that in the five years before that, 280 in that, but a total of, of 502 over those uh, five years. And then in the past three or four, um, about 74 total. So our report uh, is grouped into six chapters. We have 15 findings, um, nine recommendations. Um, and an overall summary of that is a reframing of the radioactive source categorization system, end of life management of radioactive sources, prioritization of funding and research, and development projects that aim to develop alternatives, support for equivalency studies for replacing radioactive sources, research on alternatives to cesium chloride for calibration applications, and then examination of the local infrastructure and needs in low and middle income countries prior to promoting alternatives. Uh, this is primarily in the form of um, uh, external beam radiotherapy. So uh, I'll just highlight a few of the findings that uh, we think are, are most uh, pertinent to this audience. So finding number two um, was that the US government and the international community have taken actions to strengthen the security and accountability of radioactive sources, but this is primarily focused on category one and two. Um, the security and accountability of category three sources has had a lower priority because of their lower potential to cause deterministic effects. Finding number five, um, recent modeling analysis of radio radiological events has concluded that small radiation releases and small radiation exposures of populations below the levels that can cause deterministic effects may have serious and long-term economic consequences. Various real-life radiological events are supportive of this conclusion. I highlighted a few of those a moment ago. Um, a safety system that is based solely on deterministic effects of radioactive sources may provide an inadequate level of protection to society. So then finding six, and, and our fourth recommendation, is that the U.S. government's risk reduction goal of replacement of radioactive sources with non-radioisotope alternatives will not be realized until disused sources are properly removed and disposed of. Um, the high cost of disposal and the limited options, resources, and guidance for disposal domestic, domestically and internationally may be prohibitive both for the adoption of alternatives and for appropriate end-of-life disposal of radioactive sources. So we recommend that the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission should expand its current requirements for financial guarantees to ensure that they adequately cover the end-of-life management for newly licensed radioactive sources, and that the U.S. government should develop and implement a national strategy for end-of-life management of currently owned and orphaned Category 1-2 radioactive sources and should consider it for Category 3 sources. Um, Finding number eight is that the progress with developing alternative technologies has been uneven across different applications and radionuclides. 
except for blood irradiation, where X-ray technology is considered equivalent to cesium-137 irradiation, and the case of external beam therapy, where LINAC technology is considered superior to cobalt-60 teletherapy, there are no broadly accepted replacement technologies for other applications. In some applications, no suitable replacement technology has been developed. Um, so we looked at calibration sources, uh, had a presentation from um, the U.S. NIST, um, National Institute for Science and Technology. Um, there are no re obvious replacements for cesium-137 radiators as a re reference radiation field for ionizing radiation metrology. Um, the U.S. and other governments have considered policy changes that might eliminate cesium chloride from use as radioactive sources, and that policy could be revisited in the near future. Without a suitable substitute, such a policy would have a negative effect on the calibration infrastructure in the United States and worldwide, directly affecting the safety and security of the public. Um, so this table um, looks at alternatives to cesium-137 for standardization, calibration, and testing of instruments. Um, it goes through uh, a number of the particular uses. Um, it uh, recognizes that cesium-137 is the source and then looks at uh, x-ray tubes in particular as um, how they uh, compare to cesium-137. Um, so our finding number 15 then and our last recommendation is that no progress has been made domestically and internationally with adopting alternative technologies for calibration systems to replace cesium-137 and cobalt-60 sources. There are no obvious radio, non-radioisotope alternatives for replacing cesium chloride sources used in these applications, and there is currently no research and development dedicated to exploring alternatives. This poses an obstacle in global efforts to eliminate cesium-137 in the form of cesium chloride. So our recommendation is the National Institute of Standards and Technology should engage with the research community as well as federal industry and international partners to initiate research on alternatives to cesium chloride for calibration applications. This engagement should start immediately to prepare for the possible future elimination of the use of cesium-137 in the form of cesium chloride. And I want to reiterate that, as, as stated earlier, we are not necessarily advocating the elimination of all uses of any of the radioisotopes. But one scenario that we were able to uh, come up with was if cesium replacement projects in the U.S. and worldwide um, are able to significantly reduce uh, the use of cesium-137, then manufacturers may decide that the market is not sustainable and may then um, stop offering it, in which case then um, the applications that currently have no alternatives then would end up uh, being orphaned or, or abandoned. Um, so that is why we are we're recommending that uh, research begin uh, to develop alternatives if a situation like that were to arise, or if regulations uh, were to uh, increase to the point where cesium also was not uh, available. So uh, that concludes my overview. Um, I thank you very much. Um, if you have uh, questions outside of this, you can uh, reach out to Arani Acosti. Uh, her um, email address is here. She was uh, one of the staff members at the academies uh, that supported the, the committee. Um, as of uh, the, uh, the fifth of this month, there were over two, 2,200 downloads in English 
um, in over 98 countries. It has now been uh, translated into all of the official languages of the United Nations. Uh, and this is a, a link to where you can download it. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, that was very clear <clears throat> and set out the position of the uh, National Academies very nicely in terms of um, recognizing uh, the situation and pointing out where there are risks, uh, particularly for our community, as you so nicely said at the end, um, not necessarily losing our sources, but losing any future supply because we're such a small part of the whole manufacturing uh, or, or end users of cesium chloride in particular. Okay, so that's the that's the report, and I, I encourage you all, if you haven't got a copy, to to download it. Uh, there's uh, they spoke to a large number of people. It's a very comprehensive document, um, and it's not uh, spoken to everybody, but there's a lot of interesting perspectives in there of what technology might be available in different applications that will impact perhaps not metrology, but your end users in your country um, or provide uh, ideas for future research. Um, so yes, please uh, go to the website and download it. Um, so we'll now move on to our CCR spe CCRI speakers and uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Sakithi Mistamang from the IEA. She's the SSDL officer there. Uh, previously she was at the uh, National Measurement Institute of South Africa. So extensive experience um, with radiation dosimetry and she's going to give a perspective from the radiation dosimetry uh, part of CCRI on the use of radioactive sources. So Zakithi, please share your screen and uh, Go ahead. As Malcolm has introduced me, I'm just going to cover um, broadly how the sources are being used in the metrology environment, focusing on CCRI1. So, um, as we all know, safe handling of radiation facilities and physical protection of radioactive materials are a prerequisite of the application of any um, radiation technology. So the dosimetry labs, um, whether it's a primary lab or it's a secondary standard lab, support industries and hospitals with various um, capabilities, various activities, providing measurement traceability and training. So the calibrated equipment is used uh, in decision-making whether it's determining whether the dose that is being given to the patient is correct or whether the um, equipment that is being irradiated for sterilization as the sterilization process has been finalized or various uh, radiation safety measurements. So the, the, for the areas that are covered under CSR I-1 uh, covers uh, radiation therapy, diagnostic, radiology, mostly radiation processing, research and radiation protection. I've put in nuclear medicine um, because of the SSDLs and I'm just going to, even though I'm not going to uh, give details on it. So if we look at radiation therapy, uh, calibration requirements at the moment is that the traceability should be to the cobalt 60 source. And most of the laboratories follow the guidance documents like the IAHRS398 or the AAPM TG51, which also still refer to the requirement of calibration to uh, the cobalt. Even though now there are primary standard labs and some SSDLs that have um, linear capabilities, but the reference beam is still the cobalt 60. And for uh, brachytherapy calibrations, it's, uh, we can see that now there's starting a growth of giving traceability both in cobalt and in iridium, even though there's still some of the labs that are still using uh, cesium sources. So just to give you an idea of the labs that are actually the number, looking at the numbers, this covers mostly the secondary standard dosimetry lab that are a member of the network. So 
For radiation therapy, we have about 49 members that are capable of performing calibrations for radiation therapy. And of course, all of them have uh, cobalt-60 source. And uh, there's now two SSDLs that have got HDR machines and they perform calibrations using cobalt-60 and iridium-192. And then there are some SSDLs that are using cesium-137 sources, for, but that's for low dose rate. So if we look at radiation protection, uh, in radiation protection, the calibrations are performed for um, a wide range of uh, services and for a wide range of users. So they, there's quite a variety of instruments that are, are being used. And um, if we look at also the, the users that are actually using the equipment that is um, used for radiation protection purposes. It covers from hospitals, mining industry, and to uh, food industry and research facilities. And the, 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 the scope of the radiation level that they measure is quite wide. So most of the uh, calibration facilities have got uh, Cesium. I think from the SSTL side, all of them that are using that have calibration capabilities for radiation protection have a cesium source. And then some, because of their national needs, will also have cobalt and americium source. And then there are a few that have got X-ray capabilities that are used for uh, radiation protection. So if we look at the SSTLs, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the numbers are coming mostly from the SSTLs. About 81 SSTLs have got radiation protection capabilities and 79 of those have got um, cesium sources and 48 cobalt and 17 americium. The, the number, as I said before, that the numbers in, the, in terms of that all the SSDLs that have capabilities have got cesium source. There's a discrepancy in that we have 79 and then we say there's 81 that have got radiation protection capabilities. The reason of the discrepancy is that in some of the countries, there's a duplication of these SSDLs and there will be one SSDL covering radiation protection in using cesium and another SSDL only focusing on calibration contamination, calibration of contamination monitors. So that's where the differences are. But there's also um, quite a lot of few SSDLs that are using large area sources. And I didn't break them down, but those are the sources that are being used. And then there are some that are, have got uh, neutron sources with americium beryllium is the is the, the number of americium beryllium sources being used are in the majority. So if we look at the regulations, I mean, laboratories follow various international standards in setting up and performing these calibrations. And the services provided assist the users also in ensuring that compliance with their own regulations and also assist the regulators uh, in actually ensuring that their equipment is also uh, working properly when they go out to do surveillances. And the regulations mostly are based on the international standards like the ISO, IEC, ICRP, uh, ICRU, ANSI, NS, NCRP, and some of the IAA uh, documents. And most of the regulations require that the radiation protection instruments be calibrated using a cesium source. If you look at the current standard ISO 4037, even though it covers also for uh, X-rays, it also includes still the use of um, cesium sources. And uh, we look at radiation processing Dosimetry for radiation processing is also crucial, whether it's, also, it's for food irradiation, sterilization, or sterile insect techniques. And if we look at the guidance document that the IAA has published for food irradiation, traceability is provided using cobalt and cesium sources, 
as well as low and high energy uh, electrons in the absorbed dose range. And if we, we all know as metrology that how crucial it is to actually have comparisons. And uh, if we look at the comparisons that are organized at the CSRI level that are piloted by the BIPM, out of the nine comparisons, four of, the, four of those are dependent on radionuclide uh, sources to actually perform the measurements. So we can see that for the metrology um, activities, there's still quite a need for the use of the sources. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zakithi. So, um... Uh, Zakithi's given the SSDL perspective, but you can sort of expand that to all of the National Metrology Institutes uh, across uh, the world that sort of speaking to those same sources which are essential for calibration. Thank you. So now we'll move on to section two. Section two of CCRI covers uh, radionuclide metrology, uh, and we have the vice chair of that committee, Rita van, uh, van Wingart uh, from ANSTO. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so from the perspective of CCRI2, radioactive sources play an integral role in the measurement of radionuclides. So we use sources to calibrate measurement equipment for many different applications and also to monitor the stability of our instrumentation. So in this presentation, I will provide a brief overview of the industries that rely on accurate and reliable radioactivity measurements. I will describe the integral role of sources in the development and maintenance of radionuclide standards. I will describe how we perform international comparisons and also give a few examples on how we disseminate radioactivity standards to our users. Now, radionuclide standards enable accurate and reliable measurements to support health, trade, safety, and the environment. Um, accurate metrology is key to ensuring that the multiple applications of ionizing radiation do not put patients, radiation workers, the general public, or the environment at risk. But then accurate metrology requires radionuclide sources for the calibration of equipment and for monitoring of instrument stability. The radionuclide metrology is quite a diverse field. This table provides a snapshot of all the radionuclides for which at least one NMI has declared a calibration and measurement capability on the BIPM's key comparison database. So what this means is that each of these radionuclides has been standardized because somebody needed a standard. Now, radionuclide sources are central to the development and maintenance of radionuclide standards. So in the first instance, accurate, precise, and safe source dispensing is critical for our preparation of sources. These sources can be used for primary standardization, for calibration of secondary equipment, or they can be manufactured for customers. For primary standards, we will typically prepare five to 10 counting sources with activities in the kilobecquerel range to determine the activity concentration of a master solution from first principles. However, developing a primary standard is a complex and time consuming process. So to preserve such standards, we transfer them to a secondary standard ionization chamber in the form of radionuclide specific calibration factors. These factors can then be applied to certify new sources. Now to preserve the accuracy of our standards, we need the reproducibility and stability of an ionization chamber and associated current measurement device to be better than around 0.1%. So on the plot in the right hand side, you can see a typical linearity measurement for our ionization chamber with non-linearity due to ion recom recombination effects at high current values and switching between capacitor ranges in the electrometer at 20,000, 2,000 and 200 picoamps respectively. So what we do is we use a set of radium 226 reference sources to account for this nonlinearity 
and also any instability in the system due to temperature fluctuations, potential gas leaks from the pressurized ionization chamber or drift in the electronics. We also use sources to calibrate gamma spectroscopy equipment, which can then be applied to quantify radionuclides and identify impurities in our sources. Now, how do we establish equivalence between national standards? The International Reference System or SIR was established by the BIPM in 1976 as a means to compare national standards for gamma emitting radionuclides. Similar to our secondary standard, it consists of a pressurized ionization chamber in lead shielding and participants send standardized ampule to the BIPM where the current produced by an ampule is compared to that produced by one of five reference radium sources. So over the past 45 years, the SIR has produced 776 independent results for 72 different radionuclides. However, the operation of the SIR relies on a set of sealed radium 2 to 6 reference sources. And these sources are aging and indefinite use is not allowed by the national regulator in France. So this poses a problem to the ongoing use of the SIR. So solutions that the CCRI2 are working on include new technology um, for improved current linearity so that we would need fewer reference sources and also using a different radionuclide for stability measurements. Holmium 166M was chosen as the most promising alternative. And this is nice because it doesn't have the same complication of radium 226, which decays through a series of daughter radionuclides that makes it challenging to renew our radium sources. A more recent tool for key comparisons is the SIR transfer instrument or CERTI. This was established in 2013 to compare national standards for short-lived gamma emitting radionuclides. As far as I know, um, this has been calibrated against the SIR for five radionuclides and it consists of a well-characterized sodium iodide well detector in shielding and with the data acquisition system. The transfer instrument is used with a niobium reference source with niobium-94 um, used to monitor the stability of the system and niobium-93M x-rays used to consistently set the counting threshold. So for this type of comparison, the equipment is shipped to the participating NMI the NMI prepares certified sources in the same ampule geometry that we use for the SIR and comparison measurements are taken by BIPM staff. So with the travel constraints imposed by COVID, the BIPM established the capability to also collect these measurements remotely. Nevertheless, this comparison is limited to two, two NMIs participating per year. Another type of comparison is the large scale K2 key comparison. With this comparison type, the pilot laboratory will distribute aliquots of the same master solution to participants. The pilot laboratory is quite often one of the larger NMIs and that's quite a significant um, drain on resources on their side. Um, when possible, some of the participants will submit standardized ampules of the same solution to the, SI to the BIPM to also provide a link to the SIR. And with all these different types of comparisons rely on shipping sources around the world. So this is complicated by regulatory compliance and also shipping and customs clearance delays can impact comparisons as radionuclides decay and impurities sometimes become more dominant. So the final part of the presentation is on our dissemination of standards. 
So this can be achieved through certified sources, for example, solutions, gases, point sources, also solid sources in various matrices, for example, soil, vegetation, water equivalent solids, also sealed sources such as the radium two to six sources that we use with our ionization chambers and large area sources that we use for calibration of contamination monitors. Another way in which certified sources are disseminated to users is, is through proficient, proficiency tests or on-site traceability measurements performed by NMI personnel. So the previous slide focused on sources that NMIs send out to their users but standards can also be disseminated through sources or instruments submitted by users to NMIs for calibration. Very short-lived radionuclides can only be standardized at the production site. This can be used, um, this can be achieved using a portable primary standardization system or otherwise using a transfer instrument with traceability to the national standard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frida. Um, yeah, clearly section two has the most uh, radioactive sources, but also probably the, uh, the lowest activity at the same time. But uh, these are some of the things we're going to be looking at uh, as part of this task group um to ensure that where the risks are to the metrology structure um in ionizing radiation so i'll just introduce neil he is the vice chair of section three which de deals with neutron metrology and he's at the national physical laboratory neil thank you okay hello everyone um thank you for inviting me to talk here uh i'm just going to give you a brief talk about neutron sources and their applications in metrology uh quick overview just talk about the different neutron source types uh the applications in neutron metrology and then very briefly mention the alternatives that we might be looking at if we were going to replace sources uh so i think as mentioned earlier generally neutron sources they're encapsulated californium 252 or a mixture of an alpha emitter or gamma emitter and the target material such as americium and beryllium or radium 226 and beryllium and they're in these welded up steel capsules like that that's generally what we talk about when we mean a radionuclide neutron source uh, you get neutrons from spontaneous fission or alpha and gamma end reactions and the way it's measured is by calibrating in a manganese bath as shown there uh, particularly with a californium 252 source you can get very high emission rates up to about 10 to the 9 uh, neutrons per second which works out a quite high dose rate, about 12 millisieverts an hour at one meter. Uh, they're really good because they approximate as a point source. Uh, they're not they're not spherical, so they're cylindrical. So unfortunately, there's some an isotropy to consider, which is a measurement we make. Uh, and these are plots at the bottom here. And uh, as opposed to gamma sources, they don't have single energies of neutrons, they have broad energy spectra as is shown at the bottom here. So that was to be factored in. Uh, but it is possible to modify the spectrum to create either like a thermal field or a, a simulated workplace field. So the applications, um, the main one really is as a reference standard for neutron fluence and neutron dose. There's a the sort of fundamental method in use at all NMIs and probably all secondary labs with neutron facilities. And the, <clears throat> the reason is basically you can't you can't measure neutron dose directly. So you have a, a neutron source uh, placed, as you can probably see in this photo here. And uh, you know the emission rate of the source measured probably in a, the manganese bath uh, on the previous slide. And you know the how anisotropic it is. So you place an instrument at a fixed distance from it and you know uh, you can work out the uh, fluence from the decay corrected emission rate and the anisotropy factor and the air attenuation. And once you know the fluence, you can then apply a spectrum average to fluence to dose conversion coefficient to turn it into a dose figure. So it's, it's very straightforward. 
And uh, as is shown in the bottom here, you can also use these sources to produce a simulated workplace field with either a, a sphere surrounding a, a source by a sphere of heavy water or placing a shadow block. So you're just looking at the kind of scattered neutral energy spectrum. Uh, another application that's in use at a lot of metrology labs is uh, creating a thermal neutron field using radionuclide sources. Uh, there's various ones at different labs uh, shown around the side here. You use one or more radionuclide neutron sources, usually americium beryllium or sometimes plutonium beryllium in a graphite or polythene assembly. And uh, the graphite or polythene moderates the neutrons, uh, but unfortunately you do need, you know, you need some kind of characterization to go on to actually be able to work out what the thermal fluence is and the thermal dose is at the calibration point here. Uh, but obviously it's a very stable field because it's just relying on the sources which have like half-lives of 100 years or more. Uh, but unfortunately it does give you quite a low intensity field, but obviously it's low maintenance as well. Uh, another uh, application which itself isn't actually a neutron source, but we, here we're using uh, material to measure neutrons by making it radioactive. So we use activation foils, which are generally metal foils, such as those shown here, which is a, this is a gold foil. You place the foil in a, in a neutron field, uh, the foil becomes active, and you then measure that foil later in a, a beta, gamma, or a beta, gamma coincidence counter. And then from the activity you've induced in the foil, you can work out uh, what the neutron fluence was that produced the activity provided you know the spectrum averaged cross-section uh, that you're measuring. Uh, and there's, these are gold foils here, but there's a whole variety of foils you can use depending which energy of neutron you're interested in measuring. Uh, so gold's particularly useful for thermal neutrons, but for higher energies in particular, iron and aluminium are used if you're trying to measure uh, the T neutrons, which is the ones shown here in the photo. Uh, these probably aren't, uh, on a concern, I guess, in terms of uh, safety and security so much because the, the half-lives are very short generally of the foils because you, you use a foil once and then you, when it's decayed, you can reuse it again because the half-lives are generally days or sometimes even hours. Uh, and generally the activities are quite low that are produced in the foils. Um, so another important part of uh, radioisotope sources in neutron metrology and probably in all other uh, radiation metrology is as part of a quality system really just to verify performance uh, because the radionuclide sources are very stable or at least predictably decaying at least you can demonstrate long-term stability of your system uh, by just repeat measurements in a sort of Define geometry with a radionuclide source and produce a, a plot as shown there, for instance. So, we, uh, this is probably not an exhaustive list, but for example, in the manganese bath, we use uh, a radium beryllium source and americium beryllium sources just to measure the uh, long term stability of the system. And even the, the sodium iodide detectors are checked uh, every time we use them using cesium 137 sources. Uh, this is what the plot's showing here. The long counters that we use uh, to measure neutrons produced from our accelerator, they're checked uh, routinely using americium beryllium sources. Uh, the activation foil counting system that uh, is based on the, the activation foils that we were talking about earlier, they're checked using a, a small cobalt 60 source. And uh, bonosphere detectors that we use for making uh, spectrum measurements, particularly at, in workplace fields, uh, they're checked. The, the actual response of these sort of internal helium-3 counters is checked routinely using an americium beryllium source. Uh, so they're all vital, vital roles that the sources are playing here. Uh, one other application is just going back to the manganese bath. Uh, that itself needs to be calibrated using an intense solution of manganese 56, uh, as shown here, which uh, you can either produce in a reactor or another thermal field. Then you standardize it uh, using a coincidence counter or an ion chamber. And uh, you need this to be able to work out what your neutron emission rate is from the, the count rate from your 
the count rate that sodium iodide measure from the activity of a solution that is passed through them. And these are the measurements that are made several times per year. Uh, so very briefly, I want to just go over some alternatives, uh, which are various pros and cons, and none of them are probably ideal compared to radionuclide sources. Uh, but the accelerators, uh, obviously very large, expensive, high maintenance, and um, that still doesn't get you out of the problem of using radionuclide sources because the output of them is traceable to radionuclide sources by using long counters and other detectors that have been previously calibrated with a radionuclide neutron source. Uh, as portable neutron generators that generally either use the DT reaction or DD reaction. These are smaller and less expensive, probably lower maintenance than a, a full-blown accelerator like the one shown there. Obviously, if it's a DT uh, generator, then it's still got some radionuclide inside it because it's containing tritium. So it still doesn't solve some of the problems of using radioisotopes. Uh, the outputs are, again, traceable to radionuclide sources and uh, say, are they reliable enough for metrology? Probably not, I would say, but that might be uh, open for discussion. Uh, another one we can probably rule out is using a reactor. Uh, and this tiny one here, I've no experience of using these, but I've heard them talked about this device called a Nutristor, which I think was made by Sandia. It's a very small kind of new technology and inexpensive, but gives you quite a low output of neutrons, uh, probably with a limited lifespan. So maybe not sure how useful that would be for metrology. Okay, that was the end of my slide. Thank you, Neil. Uh, very useful uh, and very nice to see those uh, alternatives at the end. Um, we're not sort of, as I said at the beginning, we're not looking to sort of identify obvious solutions or point out the problems with accelerators um, or to sort of just say the NASEM report says you've got to get rid of them and we can't get rid of them. It's basically just asking uh, what Thomas said at the beginning, if we lose these sources, you know, what can we do? And it's worth asking those questions. Okay, so that's, we've heard from the speakers. Um, and this is really, as I said at the beginning, setting the scene for the task group uh, that has been formed within CCRI. They'll be looking at the NASME report, um, looking at the, the pressures and the requirements for the different sections and providing basically a ionizing radiation metrology response of, of where we should be uh, looking, what perhaps uh, NMI should be doing, what the community to, together should be doing. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not going to have a brief uh, for the next 25 minutes or 20, 20 minutes or so. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion with, with the four speakers um, so feel free uh, for all of you to unmute uh, at this point, and I'm going to ask some uh, questions, some general ones for discussion, and then I'll pick up on questions that have been in the chat. And if you've got any others, uh, then please post them there and either I'll read them out or I'll ask you to ask them directly uh, if it needs a bit more clarification. So the first question to the panelists, um, and it's not a definitive one, it's really just sort of giving your perspective on this. In terms of radioactive sources and alternatives, where should our focus as a uh, radiation metrology community be? Um, what's the important thing uh, to be spending our immediate time on? And uh, I'll go to Thomas first, uh, and I think I know his answer, um, but uh, just, just want him to say it rather than me interpreting what he said. <laughs> Um, I think that the, the primary concern from the point of view of our report would continue to be cesium chloride um, because of its dispersibility in that. Um, so yeah, I think I'll stop there. Yep. No, I, I think that's the one we... Uh we recognize as being uh, at risk um, and also being, as Sikhiti said, central to so much of radiation protection. Um, moving to you, Zakithi, on that, um, where do you see the, the focus in terms of radioactive sources, uh, the obvious role the IAA plays in terms of reducing the risk due to uh, source 
uh, incidents, etc., but also recognizing the, the metrology aspect? Um, there's two things maybe that I could speak to is uh, one is ensuring safety, including security of the facilities with the sources and training of people that are using their sources. And the other one is probably coordinating capabilities in the regions and cascading sources um, so that, you know, like if you have sources that one institute needs a higher activity and the next one would be using a lower activity source for radiation protection, then you could have a source starting at a hospital and then ending up at an SSDL for calibration, calibrating um, instruments. So things like that. Those are the short-term things that we could work on. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop with that on that one. So just to clarify on that last part, the idea would be working out a, uh, effectively, uh, as you say, a cascade where you reduce the uncertain, the activity required by laboratories by reducing the number of high activity sources, but cr by creating this cascade, is that what you mean? So let's take, for, let's take, for example, a, a hospital that would have the cobalt 60 source. So they come in at quite a higher activity. But when they discard of the source after five years, the SSDL can still use the same source for performing the calibrations. So wow. they, yeah, so that's what I mean, that the sources could, that could be used at uh, other, at hospitals could be cascaded to uh, SSDLs or other labs for various activities. Okay, look. and so this basically keeps them under control rather than, as Thomas mentioned, the idea that sources are not currently always well maintained through end of life. Um, and so tightening up that uh, and providing a, a route for those older sources so that they don't become orphaned and just kind yes. of purely secured. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, okay, uh, I'll keep with the speaker order. So, Neil, um, anything uh, from the neutron side? I think you you highlighted both where the sources are important and also potential alternatives. And I, I guess reactors is the big kind of elephant in the room because people still want those for intense neutron beams, um, and they're still likely to be around. Um, is it? Uh, is it about getting better access to reactors? Is that a solution or is it looking at these electronic uh, uh, solutions or, or is it just that we need AMBI and California well, sources? Probably a bit of everything really. Um, I think <laughs> the, the, problem, the problem with California that's been like that for the last 10 years or more, I guess, is the very high cost of it, which is kind of make, put it out of the reach of lots of labs and uh, perhaps having in the half life obviously is only two and a half years so uh, labs aren't able to replace their sources as often as they would have done in the past I think right so if uh, and I mean all the Californium generally comes from Oak Ridge there is a place in Russia as well that produces it as well but uh, there's a very sort of monop uh, monopolized situation there really uh, which is probably why it costs so much as well but um if there was a solution to that, I don't know. If the, if the generators could be used in place of Californium, uh, they were reliable and as easy to use as just putting a point source in a cup next to a detector, then that would certainly help. But I think we're some way off that and it's probably, a, it's, the, it's a technological problem, I suppose, rather than a metrological problem initially, I think. The you sort of, one thing I wanted to, to... Uh, tease out from you on uh, you sort of gave a little bit about it but the my understanding is the electronic sources are often the spectrum are very different from the the radioactive sources and how mm -hmm. finding that equivalence that's an ad added challenge I think for neutrons compared to perhaps uh, uh, gammas that we yeah, worry about it would, it would change it would change everything I guess because yeah they're, they're generally giving a single energy these electro uh, electronic based uh, generators if it's DT, they're giving sort of 14.8 MeV, or if it's a DD, then they're giving like two and a half MeV. It's just a more well, a broad, broad peak, but uh, quite different from what you'd get from a radionuclide source. Uh, and it, it varies as well with the angle as well. So 
it's not as straightforward as an isotropic, but at least the, the point, the Californium source is the spectrum is at least isotropic. So it doesn't matter which angle you place your detectors at. Right. You have to take that into account as well with the, just the kinematics of a sort of DT reaction. Right. So yes, yeah, so a, a lot of complexities in neutrons. I, I, I don't envy the <laughs> challenges you have in section three, to be honest. Um, and also the, the other bit with section three, I think you didn't uh, tease out as, or, or present that the limited number of facilities we sort of, as a key you know, talked about how many SSDLs have a cobalt 60 source or a cesium source. Um, but for the NMIs, the access to anything other than sources is a real challenge. I think we've, you, you've talked about this in section three about how do you do comparisons, mm -hmm. who maintains this uh, much more complex equipment. NPL has quite a bit, but it's it's much more sporadic, isn't it? In, for, in yeah, NMI that's community. right, really. There's, there's very few uh, NMIs that have uh, an accelerator like NPL and PTB have. Uh, most most are just reliant on sources, I guess, and some of that's just because the neutron group at a lot of NMIs is perhaps only sort of one or two deep, mm. uh, uh, whereas other groups, other radiation areas are probably a bit bigger than that. And sometimes it's or not even one or two deep. It's sort of someone, someone in a different radiation area kind of has a wears a neutron hat for certain days of the week and right. kind of has to multitask quite a bit. So it's yeah. It's quite yeah. low, but and it probably that's because there's lower demand for neutron calibration. So it's, it probably doesn't warrant having a big group of people doing it. But right. it's a it's a small field, I guess. And, and that's sort of, I think this is why we're bringing this task group together, because I think some of what uh, the uh, Thomas's report uh, talks about, the, the activities required are likely to be larger than any of the individual players can can embark on it perhaps we're going to look at have to look at some collaborative uh exercises or, or collaborations to to drive some of this because as you say so many of the nmis and the calibration labs are very thin in terms of their the personnel on some of these things okay uh and frida sorry uh didn't ask you that yeah the i i think there's a lot of sources with section two, but perhaps uh, no immediate, uh, apart from the, the radium, I think that's a very good example um, of where the Holmium is, is offering a, an alternative. Uh, anything else where you see a, a, a risk for, for, radio, for section two? I think not a risk as much. I think the radium sources really does present a problem, but a few years ago, there was a, working group established as a combination between the CCEM and CCRI. And they've been working on alternative technologies to measure current, low currents, as we do with our ionization chambers. And they've come up with some really elegant, powerful solutions. I just didn't have, we haven't implemented that in our lab yet. So I didn't have easy access to, to nice plots to show what, what this working group is, has achieved. So they've come up with a really nice solution to reduce our reliance on radium standards. Although I don't think that's something that's going to be, that, that, that can be implemented in hospitals and just everywhere where we, where radioactive sources are used to monitor stability of our equipment. But it's, it's something nice that's been done. Yeah, and it gives us a clear, uh, at least a precedent of what can be done when uh, we kind of, as, as metrologists, we tend to be very conservative and not want to change things. But I think that joint working group shows where uh, some sources can be removed through the application of, of technology. So that's useful as a starting point as we begin to look at other things. Um, Thomas, coming back to you, I, I really like the fact you made it clear that the the report isn't talking about eliminating all sources and um, on and prioritizing either. It's just laying out some important findings and saying these are risks. And I think so. Just want to verify that there's not really a a sort of looming uh, Armageddon of z zero sources. It's sort of recognizing it's all about risk and security. That's sort of the driver. Um, 
you know, we don't have to be planning to get rid of everything. Uh, it's all about reducing uh, reliance, uh, particularly on on things like cesium-137. Yeah, I mean, that would be, I think, a fair statement of where the way things are right now. But um, I think one other thing that we were aware of is, you know, if there were to ever be a, a severe incident, then things could change very rapidly. And so that is, again, the reason we are promoting uh, the beginning of R&D to identify alternatives um, so that we're not caught flat-footed. Right. You know, the uh, nuclear has that, uh, that trigger kind of potential of, of something uh, uh, happening, like Fukushima changing uh, a lot of national policies uh, in terms of nuclear power. Um, sort of uh, moving on then to, to, to Keithy on that, sort of following on from that, um, anticipating that status quo is not always uh, maintainable, however good the metrology um, uh, argument might be uh, in terms of, and Freda has shown it, and I think uh, everybody understands that the stability or the predictable output of radioactive sources is a kind of essential for equipment, uh, QA, but also dissemination. As you said, Cobalt-60 uh, for radiotherapy and cesium-137 for um, radiation protection are sort of at the heart of all of our calibrations. Um, and I see questions there about sort of alternatives for cesium-137 moving to X-rays, uh, Cobalt-60 moving to LINAC-based systems. Um, from an IEA perspective, is are Linux uh, really realistic as a dissemination tool for calibrations? Um, uh, Thomas mentioned it in his presentation about the looking at the infrastructure and the challenges in in uh, low and middle income countries. Um, what's the IA, IA perspective on replacing, uh, particularly Cobalt sixty? I think because that's probably one you've looked at more. Um, I think. I'll start with just saying that access to calibration facilities for all users is really quite crucial. And, and trying to eliminate the sources will create a void for some of the low income, low and middle income countries. So if you also look at the, the issue of, um, even if you look at therapy, alternative um, therapy treatment, the, 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 yes, you could install the instrument, but the issue then becomes whether it's sustainable for the country and whether you can still treat as many patients as you would treat with the cobalt-60 source. There's a lot of things that we need to look at. And I think the issue of the cobalt still remains the source of traceability for dosimetry and radiation therapy, because, I mean, as... Um, Clause indicated in the chat for proton therapy that not every country has got a proton center. So the traceability is still going to be through the cobalt 60 source. And even if you look at the radiation protection capabilities and the calibrations in radiation protection, some of the countries don't have stable electricity grids to even be able to house an an X-ray unit. So those those limitations that we need to look at when we're looking at low-income countries. That yes, there are other challenges that needs to be considered to make sure that the labs or the end user still is able to 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 receive um, calibrations. Right. So there's a there's a whole infrastructure side of things that we sort of. We can tend to talk about the alternative technology side, but what you're actually pointing out is also that the infrastructure has to be maintained while a transfer of technologies occurs. Um, and there's a there's a comment uh, in uh, in the chat there about blood irradiators. I think has been a very uh, highly successful transfer where. Uh, cesium has been replaced by often dual X-ray systems and um, 
they provided the 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 necessary uh, replacement and it's a it's a drop in kind of situation where it it works and so we should look at where where successes have happened and see whether we can learn from that um, uh, and i think x-rays and, and uh, the the uh, high power high voltage certainly um the X-ray tubes are going up back again to sort of higher above 400 kV and beyond, which begins to get us towards cesium as, as a solution. And I think um, we it's an area perhaps that does deserve some more research. And I know a number of uh, NMIs, uh, I believe in China and uh, Japan perhaps are looking at uh, higher kV uh, standards and, and, and instrumentation and the we're still a long way away from the 662 of, of cesium but I, I think looking at that is going to be something that will help uh, shape the picture of how essential cesium is as a calibration source from a technology side of things the infrastructure side which you talked about um, is still very different because uh, of the way that cesium is embedded in IEC standards and uh, and all of the requirements, as you pointed out. Uh, we're coming up to 8.30 and I don't want to keep people beyond that. Um, I'm just going to, uh, there was one question and I think this, I'm gonna point this towards Thomas, uh, perhaps because you can say this. Um, you, you mentioned briefly about vitrified cesium. And I think uh, when I read that, I kind of jumped on it. Oh yes, perhaps it's a solution for um, for for metrology. Um, this is just changing the encapsulation or, or making it undispersible. Is that my understanding? Is correct? Um, well, certainly less dispersible. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it, um, and, and this is well, we 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 looked into this a little bit. Um, but I think the concern would be, while it would certainly minimize the opportunity for accidental uh, releases, like what happened at the University of Washington, um, in terms of a, an explosive device, uh, it's not clear that that would have a significant impact on the, um, how, how an explosive device would work. So, yeah, the, the 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 powder release clearly is a contamination um, mess that that has uh, implications, as you say, uh, a destructive uh, weapon type thing. Maybe not uh, significantly different, uh, but that doesn't really change the fact that you, the important point you raised, which is the the reduction in all other applications of cesium chloride, um, may well drive all of the producers from the market. So it doesn't matter that there could be a different encapsulation if there's nobody producing it. And that's that's a reality we have to recognize that however important metrology is, and we believe it to be absolutely essential, we're not the biggest users. Um, and I think on the Cobalt 60 side, we can sort of take a little bit of um, relief that the industrial processing users are still very large and therefore there's a very big demand still there for cobalt 60 that we can hang on to. Cesium and 137 appears to be going a different direction where calibration labs could end up being the only people who really want it, but nobody's willing to produce it. And I think that's a concern we have to look at. Okay, so I want to draw, um, unless someone has a burning question, and if you do, um, feel free to unmute and just ask it and raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I will um, uh, draw this webinar to a close. Thank you so much for uh, attending at various times. Really want to thank Thomas, who is in central, uh, central time in the US and therefore began this presentation at 6 a.m. Uh, so thank you so much, Thomas. Really appreciate uh, you making that effort and, and presenting to us. Uh, thank you to Frida for staying up late uh, in Australia and for everybody else in Europe, you're very lucky that you get to do it at a reasonable time. Um, 
Our next webinar will be in May, uh, and you'll you'll hear you'll get the announcement from uh, from uh, Vincent about that for registration. Um, and uh, as Vincent said, the speakers, if you're willing to share your slides, send them to him, and they will be put onto the YouTube uh, channel, and the presentation will be available there. Um, thank you very much, and enjoy your day or good night. <laughs>